All right, yeah, here we yeah. go. Let's do it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trader Berlin Show. It is your Thursday and final show for this week as I'm taking tomorrow off. I guess I told you about that one earlier. Hope you all had a great trading day out there today. Anybody who loaded up buying that dip on cryptos, I'm sure you're probably pretty darn happy right now. So hello, everybody. Sue, I, I guess it's a little too hot out there in Boston. I'm glad you're still doing your workout, though. Get those exercises down. Hello, Boss Poopo, Les Gold, Thomasina, Ivzy. Good to have you back with us. It has been a while to see you uh, join us here. Lori, uh, we got, uh, what else we got in there? Jerry? And Herbert, good to have you back with us again. Daryl as well, good to have everybody with us. Um, I'm going to throw this out there. I, I am a huge fish fan, for those who have not figured it out. Monster fish fan. Tickets went on sale for some packages today. They were sold out in seconds. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. So if you guys, if some one of you can get me the four-day pass... Tomorrow at 10 a.m., I will re reward you handily. They'll probably sell out in seconds, but I just put the link in there. There you go. There's a four-day pass. See you in Vegas. All right, enough of my pandering and asking you guys to buy tickets for me, which I will pay you fully for plus a bonus. Uh, let's go to the topic at hand, which is uh, this is going to be a lot of fun today. That's why I have a, a glass of whiskey here for me, certainly in celebration of the crypto bounce, but also in celebration of the guest today. We're going to be joined by none other than Mr. John Rowland talking about trading on the floor of the NYMEX. I called it a day in the life of a floor trader. Mr. Rowland, how are you doing today? Hello, Merlin. Cheers. Welcome. Happy Cheers. quasi Friday for me. Happy Thursday for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thirsty Thursday. It is a thirsty Thursday. Ooh, that's some good bourbon right there. Good lord. Um, all right. One of the things uh, that I wrote in kind of the description for the show today was I kind of had fun with it. The, the, the floor traders are almost creatures of lore, this mythical creature that we all hear stories about and uh, the crazy antics that went on. There's all kinds of movies about it. And anybody who is currently trading is screen-based trading. You're on your phone, you're on your you know, your, your laptop or PC. You miss this energy that's in this picture that I have over here. You guys can see it, just tons of people, all these pits, elbowing, pushing, shoving. And I wanted to talk about a day in the life of a floor trader. But before we dive into like, you know, on the floor type things, when you woke up every morning, was there a routine that you went through? I mean, what, what were the things that you thought about? You got out of bed other than, God, I wish I could stay in bed. What, were, what was your start to the day? Well, you know, when you suggested this subject matter, I was like, you know, this is kind of a weird thing. And I was like, what am, what am I going to talk about, right? You know, I mean, like, you know, like, woke up, fell out of bed, dragged a comb across my head, <laughs> found my way downstairs and drank a cup. Drank a cup and, <laughs> Looking up, I was noticed I was late, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that that song was written about floor traders. That's incredible. The Beatles were ahead of their time. <laughs> yeah, they were definitely ahead of their time. Yeah. No, um, so you got to remember in, in my, my career, I had I had really two careers in the, in the time in the floor. And so the first part of my career, I was a floor broker, a floor commission merchant, and I represented large institutional traders. Now, when we talk about energy markets, we're talking about the seven sisters, right? If you pump gas, I guarantee you that I probably hedged a product or, or crude oil for one of those companies. So my day usually typically would start around 4.30 in the morning and we'd get a call. I'd get a call from our London desk who would tell me what had happened in the overnight, um, what had happened during the London session. And uh, tell me what any of our international customers things that they were doing or trying to attempt to do in terms of hedging or you know uh, charting uh, mm -hmm. excuse me trading um, and that would kind of just get my mindset into what was the market going to do now in the old days we had what was called the market call which was before the pits opened up you had this call that was an anticipation of where the market was going to open. It was going to open up five cents higher, ten cents higher, dollar lower, whatever. It's kind of like so fair value that, today, right? Yeah, Similar. exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it was based a lot on what was happening in London at the time. So by the time I got to work, I usually got to work between, I don't know, 7.30 and 8 o'clock. Uh, the first thing I would do was I would go and call all of my customers and you know one of the things I taught all my AEs was you know KYC know your customer and I knew which customers what they wanted to hear or what things I needed to give information that I gave to them but really that that part of that morning session 
was me gleaning stuff from them and getting information from them. What are they looking at? What are they? What do they need to hedge? What prices that they want? And a lot of times these guys would say, "Hey, you know, I want to hedge. You know, we feel like we want to hedge. You know, X millions of barrels, or you know, this month's production. But we don't feel like these prices are attractive. We want higher prices or lower prices or whatever." So you know, I'd file that away in my head to remember that, and then when price got there during the trading day, then I'd tell my account executives or or myself, I'd jump out of the ring and call these guys up and say, hey, there's this opportunity right now that what you were looking to do, we can do it, do it right now in the ring. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of how my day would start when I was an institutional trader. But we also did a lot of uh, technical analysis. We'd write a morning sheet and put out support and resistance. A lot of those things that we've talked about in the past, you and I, about floor traders' pivots and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We had, uh, I created a proprietary momentum number as well, and we put that out and we say, hey, as long as price is above here, we believe price is going to go up. Once the price moves below here, we think price is going to go down. All those kind of things. Um, you know, back in those days, you know, we didn't have these fancy, I sound like the old man, you know, we didn't have these fancy computers, yeah. right, you know. Um, that, that's what was my I question. Like you didn't sticks and things, right? Yeah. I looked at literally a daily chart. I know Bob Dunn is one of your fans, and he tells you the exact same thing. The old days it was pen and paper and pencil and a bar chart yeah. with dailies, and that was all we looked at. So now yeah. that, that was my. So it's interesting you say you're charting. I actually uh, from I would anticipate that you didn't do charting because when I look at these pictures of the floor, and I'll, and I'll show everybody a picture. Here's a picture of the NYMEX. I don't know what year this was, but for the most part, you don't see anybody, not one screen has a price chart. A lot of them have order books where you can see the orders lining up. You can see some brokers over here with order books, but nobody's got really charts on there. And it was interesting to me because I was always under the impression that this wasn't a technical analysis pit. This was fundamentals or looking over and seeing the guy from Goldman in the yellow vest and seeing him buying. You're like, okay, damn it. He's buying. I'm jumping on his coattails. Not so much technical analysis. So what, what were you guys using? And I, I just don't see where you would have time to, to pull up an application to look at charts here. Well, it was a lot. It was. I think it was a lot of what you just said. It was more fundamental analysis, especially when I was a um, uh, institutional trader. But again, you know, one of the things that you know we teach, you know, with online trading academy taught, or the things that a lot of your viewers learn, you know, about this emotion of price. Yeah, in the pit there was this emotion of price right you know this you could tell like just by the noise if the market was busy you know um but remember as an institutional trader i had a trading deck mm-hmm. and that deck would show me who where my all my buy orders were where all my sell orders and that was kind of like technical analysis right it was like hey this is an area of support look sure. at all these buy orders this is an area of, of resistance but Believe it or not, most guys in the morning did some type of technical analysis, moving averages, or look for, you know, for instance, like Bollinger Bands. If I if in the morning I knew exactly where two standard deviations would be from current price. Now that would change throughout the day if you were looking at a regular chart, but I knew that going into the pit. So when those prices came, I was like, hey, you know what? We're two standard deviations away from what is normal, and this could be a selling opportunity or a buying opportunity, or vice versa. So there was some technical analysis, but you, to your point, yeah, it was a lot more about watching who was doing what in the pits and this, this emotional flow of, you know, of, of the order flow in the market and the locals and the market makers who are trying to push price uh, around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it always entertained me. I met a guy, and I, I don't even know whether he was an actual floor trader, but he showed me uh, price charts that he drew from hand. So every day after the market closed, he would go and he'd have you know his watch list, if you will. But these were like you know drafting board size pieces of paper. You know, we're talking fifteen yeah. feet long, three feet tall, and he'd say, "Here's the open, high, low, close." And I mean. I, it was a thing of beauty. I mean, he was the ultimate nerd. You may not, anybody knows the name Stan Ehrlich. Um, he's got he created some indicators out there too. But you know, this is this is the extent that people went to to do technical analysis and and kind of map out their day. Okay, so 
you get up early, you make some calls, you talk to your institutional clients and say, all right, what are you looking to do? How can I help you in these positions? And and I'm sure you have a group of people around you that are saying, okay, well, he's, these are the levels we're looking at, right? It's not like you have your own secret little level book and you're going, okay, that's mine, no one else knows? Mm, I mean... Everybody thought they had a secret, but you know, basically <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But um, so one of the things that you know you talk about inside the pit or things that would go on. Um, one of the things why my business grew, and one of the things why I gained this reputation among in- institutional traders, be- why they became customers of mine is I was able to use that information that I gained from you know, let's say, uh, for instance, uh, a crude oil trader tells me, hey, listen, we need to hedge today. We would really like to get this price, but I got to be hedged if price goes below here. Right. right? So I knew that, let's just pick any number. Let's say I want to sell at $67, but if it go, price goes below $63, I need to be hedged. So I knew that if price got below $63, they would become a seller. Now, on the other hand, I might have a refiner who said something like, you know, we want to hedge this production, and a refiner does hedge their their production by buying crude oil and selling products, and we want this value, right, this differential between the crude oil, barrel of crude oil and a barrel of, let's say, gasoline or, or uh, diesel heating oil. So. As price was getting closer to 63, as I know that my hedger is going to come into the market, and I guess you could call this insider information, but I didn't use it to my benefit. I used it to the benefit of my customers. I might sell some gasoline or heating oil in anticipation of the crude oil price falling. And then the crude oil price falls, and so now what I have is I have a one seller and I got a buyer, and I just match them up. So I right. get both sides of the trade. It's about business, it's about brokerage. Sure. Now, some of you might say, well, that's not fair, but really what I did is it benefited both customers because the hedger, the uh, the product hedger, was able to lock in his hedge, and the hedger of crude oil was able to get a good price because if he had to go to the market, right, and sell as to the open market, then he might have gotten a lower price, but because I was in te- anticipated this for I was able to lock in a much higher price for him because as soon as price did fall below $63, then th- th- where I had sold the products in anticipation, then that crack spread had widened. Now, right. what will happen a lot of times is, you know, the, the exchange would chart or, you know, a charting facility would say, hey, this is where that crack price is trading. And I would call up and the guy and say, hey, I did those 2,000 cracks for you. He goes, how'd you do that? The crack price never got above $7.80 and you did $8. Well, it's because I was able to do these things. So that's the kind of world that I lived in as an institutional trader, and mm-hmm. I did that for about seven years, seven excuse me, seven to ten years. What happened was is the margins of doing business started to dis- decrease, and a lot of times, you know, I would take a chance, and then if I wasn't right, I would scratch a trade or pass out or break even. And you know that cost that's cost commissions. Those sure. commissions back then were like seventy five cents a round turn. So um, there was an added cost. Now, when you're charging an institutional customer ten thousand dollars, excuse me, ten dollars a round turn, you know you could eat a little seventy five cent. But when those commissions started to get really right. tight, you know my my bosses or those who were to say, hey, you can't do this anymore because it's eating into our margin. But I would still be able to do that style of trading. So a lot of people were saying to me, hey, John, why are you doing this for these institutional traders? Why don't you just do this for yourself? And and that's what I did in the next part of my career. Next step. Right. When did that ultimately change? I mean, there has to have been you know, writing on the wall, if you will. So, for example, when I started, I started in 96, which... You know, I was just using Daytech at the time, was online, really didn't know what the hell I was doing. And in, you realize that there was, or many viewers might not realize, but this whole trading world was reserved for the financial world. It was reserved for brokers and, and market makers and specialists and people in the know that had connections. And retailers were always subject to market prices. You pay whatever the market's going to give you, you couldn't negotiate. 
Then Harvey Houtkin came along and something happened it's called SOS Bandits where they can now use small order execution system for the equity markets and that allowed people to route their orders directly to market makers and then that led to a bunch of court cases and then we as retail investors could now use ECNs and really control our own order flow and negotiate with markets and what that did is it took these spreads which in the equity markets could be two three dollars on a stock a spread and that's the, the the profit the meat that the specialist or market maker was literally making for themselves or their firm as soon as we could now negotiate markets, those spreads just crush down. Now they're, uh, if yeah. you find a spread over like three cents, you're like, whoa, oh, geez, this thing's risky, it's, it's crazy. Three cents right. back in the late 90s, or early 90s was like, oh my gosh, this is the most efficient market you've ever seen. It don't happen. So to me, like I could see the writing on the wall change, but that was equity markets. And I, it really wasn't direct access in the commodities markets for some time later. When did you kind of see the writing on the wall that you know this, this pit life is gonna end? Well, um, it was a combination of both of the the spreads had got really, really narrow, right? I, I mean, when I first started at Natural Gas, the spread was like five cents or like five hundred dollars, and then it got it came into like you know uh, five one hundredths of a cent. You know, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. how tight the market got. The other thing was. Um, when we came around, oh, I say the late 90s, when electronic trading was just starting to raise its head, right? In other words, these other platforms like, for instance, ICE, uh, Intercontinental Exchange, other avenues that industrial uh, institutional traders could use, you know, over the counter and stuff like that, those markets were very mature. That took away from the floor. The floor was basically the house and then all of a sudden the, it shifted away from the house. Right, and that right. writing on the wall was oh, about 2000, 2002 and we were able to hang on at the Merck for a while but you know some of the other exchanges the, it was very swift and when they went purely electronic I mean it was literally overnight. I went from having a, a, a brokerage business where I was billing a hundred thousand uh, a month to lucky billing two thousand a month. Wow! So it literally happened overnight. Uh, you know, you I, I think you had a, just a tremendous experience because you got to start off as an institutional trader, which is very different. Because at that point, you know, you're you're really tied to your customers. Of course, you had good relationships with them, and uh, I'm sure you're actively out always looking for more customers because more customers means more volume for you. More volume means more profits. Um, how was the transition going? And, and let me actually rephrase that. So you have this institutional side, you I mean you developed an unbelievable sense of market timing, of supply and demand principles, of kind of when this happens, this will happen, or when that doesn't happen, this is gonna happen. I mean, you learn all the little nuances of the market when you're trading somebody else's money, especially for institutions. How was the transition from that to what most of us are doing now, which is, I'm trading my own money. I mean, was it, was it a challenging transition for you because the emotions of your own money? I mean, yes. I mean, anytime you trade your own money, there's an emotion. And one of the things that good traders learn very quickly is you eliminate that emotional aspect of money. Now, that's a hard thing to do, but yeah. you don't look at trades in terms of dollars. We used to call them points or whatever. So, it's, you know, once you move it away from dollars, right, then you say, hey, well, I risk two points to make seven points or whatever, then it's just about finding winning trades right or finding those trades that are going to that are going to add up as the day goes on and it's funny as you say is you know um at the end of the day when my clerk would come to me and, and i'd ask him you know how i did you know he'd reconcile all my trades i could tell you on days that i had a losing day i could tell you to the penny how much i lost hmm. but on winning days yeah <laughs> i would i don't know how much i would win because I didn't care. I just let the trade run. I'd ring the register and move on, right? I, I just knew I had a winning trade. But losing days or when I had a losing trade or when I got to that point of risk where I didn't want to take any more risk, I knew it to the penny. So that's really, you know, the evolution of really good traders. That's, you know? It is. It's awesome. I'm glad you say that because I some people probably think and get tired of me as being a broken record because I'm always saying like the winners don't matter. The winners, w winning is a byproduct of not losing. And so for you, this is why I think you probably you were such a good trader among many reasons is it was the knowledge of those losses, right? So it's keep an eye on them and say, man, I cannot let this, I'm, I'm down X amount, I know to the penny, I'm done, I'm gonna stop. But boy, um, you know, for my early days, 
the biggest thing that uh, I guess was the biggest problem for me was not knowing my downside. I was so focused on how much money I was going to make that it's like, you know, crossing the street in London. I'm looking one way, but it was the wrong way. I need to look the opposite <laughs> direction because I was getting smoked on a regular basis. And as soon as you just say, who cares about the money? The money will take care of itself. You'll find yourself making money by accident sometimes. What you don't want to do is be losing money by accident. So you, you curtail that, do some risk management, stop losses and such. And uh, then, then you start to get to the promise land, which everybody wants. Right, right. I mean, I used to tell the students in the classroom, it was like, you know, the secret to success is it's not learning how to make money, it's learning how to stop losing money. Because right. once you stop losing, you start making money, you know, so. But it, it sounds so cliche and stupid, you know, when you, we say it, it's like, oh, duh, like, I don't want to lose money, no shit. But, I mean, the sad part is, and I think everybody watching this right now, you've all been in that situation where, you know, you're you're making money and you're like, you cut your winner short. And all of a sudden you get in a losing trade and you just let that thing go and go and go. And all of right. a sudden you're like, wow, I had five winning trades in a row and I had one loser and wiped out all those five winning trades. That is unfortunately one of the the, the common pitfalls of being a trader. So it's watch It's a learning losses. experience. I think every trader goes through it. I mean, I I'm, I'm probably went bust maybe three or four times. So, I mean, you know, sometimes it was not my fault. Sometimes it was I just had too much risk exposure. Sure. But, you know, these are learning experiences, right? So, I mean, it happens. But... It happens. All right. So you, you started off, you know, you, you analyze the markets with uh, kind of not supply and demand, but just saying, hey, these are the different zones, whether using floor pivots or whatever tools you were using. Went from institutions to managing your own money. Um, and now you you did that on the floor. How was the transition for you ultimately, which uh, from most of the floor traders I talked to from Chicago, this was one of the more challenging pieces because you have an edge on this floor. And I'll bring that picture back up for anybody who wants to see it. You, know, you I, I believe personally you had an edge on this floor over any retail trader simply because you knew who was who, you knew who were the big buyers were, and you could see the emotions. I mean, I've heard stories about uh, when I was on the floor of the CME as a tourist, uh, I was brought in by a friend. You know, one guy started telling me the story and how there was this big time trader and every time he would step on his tippy toes, meaning his heels left the ground, they knew that he was going to buy. That was his tell that he was going to go out right. there and start buying. And you know, you have that advantage. When I sit here on a regular basis and I'm looking at a screen, I do not have that advantage. I'm, I'm, I got no advantage. All I can do is look at price charts and, and to me, it's a different world. So was that hard for you? Well, to be honest with you, there's, you know, there are different types of trading and a lot of the folks that you talk to or the, the type of trading that you guys do is a very directional front month up or down sure. trading and remember my world was this world of spread trading where I was looking to take advantage of disruptions in pricing either from month to month or from contract to contract where there's these imbalances of the flow of money or flow of orders and maybe the sells that's selling crude oil down and where the products are still holding value so right. the, you know that relationship widens and so one of the things that you kind of you know you talk about techniques or things that it, you know did on the floor one of the things that as a spread trader as I, which I was, which I think was a lot easier for me to make this transition because you know I was able to see, you know, correlate the relationship of spreads to also to trends. And mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a chart in a second that's really going to bring this home for you guys. But one of the things we used to do is called paint the tape or paint the board. So if you look at, let's say, crude oil, for instance, and I don't know, you go look and see what happened today. Crude oil, let's say the June contract. You know, maybe this is a bad example, but maybe the June contract fell. I think what a dollar seventy today. It was last trading day, but if we look at the other months, right, they maybe only fell a dollar fifty or a dollar twenty. Right, the farther out you get away from the front of the board. So one of the things that we used to do was, as let's say for instance, crude oil prices were going up. The front month was going up. Let's say we go up. Think of it like in options, the delta, right? How much right. is the uh, these different months going to change? So let's say the June contract, you know, the delta is one, where the December contract, the delta is 0.5. In other words, for every dollar June goes up, maybe December only, only goes up 50 cents. But what we would do is, and I think about, I think about this, you know, it's like we got away with murder, but seriously. <laughs> but what we do is, let's say June was up a dollar, right? And you and I are buddies, 
and you and I are trading the back of the board, and, and, and I will buy a December contract from you, and you will buy a January contract from me at a dollar higher. Now, we both know that the December contract and the January contract maybe is only worth 50 cents higher or 75 cents higher. But that print would go out over every, you know, yeah. news, uh, Quotron, whatever. And um, so anybody who was watching the board or watching price, and I'm talking like in London or Dubai sure, sure. or anywhere in the world, and they're saying, oh, the December contract traded a dollar higher. I need to do something. So that might bring them to the market. Now they might be a buyer, they might be a seller, right? They might come in and offer December all the way back down 50 cents, but at least it shows their hand, right? It shows me what's going on in the market. It brings orders to the market. So that was one of the techniques as a market maker that you used to do, is you used to paint the tape, to, in other words, to invoke some type of price action. Ah, you know, the sneaky little tricks, and it's funny because I guess the statute of limitations is gone now on that, but you know, yeah. I believe it's called fomenting, which technically I believe that's where you create an impression of that the market is doing something that it might not be doing. Exactly. It's a gray yeah. area. However, these are, if any one of you believes that that the traders at Goldman and the traders at any big institution are doing everything 100% by the book without any little trickery, you are sadly mistaken. There are there's all sorts of stuff and little tricks being pulled on the market and basically what they're doing is they're basically doing all this shady crap until they get caught and when they get caught by the SEC they basically get a little little slap on the wrist they'll get fined you know 100,000 maybe 50 million dollars but they made 800 million dollars doing it so the beauty of the of the SEC and where does where does that money go? I think I need to get the SEC on the program because when I hear settlements for one point four billion dollars, I'm like, I didn't get a penny of that manipulation money. Damn it! Right, right. <laughs> I didn't see that money. <laughs> million dollar wound. Yeah. No, but seriously, what I mean, I make it sound kind of shitty, but we what we did was in in the rules of the exchange, you know. Sure. And what we were like, what you were saying is, all we were really trying to do was invoke emotion, right? Invoke a, somebody, a trader to do something, to make a mistake. And once they made the mistake, we would use that as an opportunity to capitalize on uh, their mistakes. And, and, and don't get me wrong, guys. The, the floors, not, not just the NYMEX, but the CME, they have all kinds of compliance and regulatory departments on site to make sure things are done properly. Of course, I'm sure some stuff slides through the cracks every now and again, but um, you know, this is, when you deal with money, a lot of times ethics and morals can go out the window very quickly when you're dealing with big, big sums of money like this. Yeah, I mean, you look at the exchange was an essential exchange, and all the orders came to there. So right. we kind of saw like what was going on all around the world. Nowadays, with all these decentralized exchanges, I'm going to give you a great example. This morning, I had an order to sell Fisker, right, the EV stock, yeah. at 13.05. I had this GTC that's been sitting in there for I don't know a couple weeks, and the market opened up. It gapped up higher. It opened up at 3.09. 3,500 contracts traded on the opening range. I got a partial fill of 28 lots. So I called my broker up and said, hey, market's high, it's 309, and I had an order in 305, where's my fill? Oh, well, you know, and he started giving me all the same lip <laughs> service. That, and you know what, I was thinking about it, I was like, it's just, it's just payback, you know, yep. because- <laughs> Karma came because back and you. Know, oh, you know, you're on this exchange, this bad, and and those were filled on, this. I don't care where they were filled. I, I, what you what are you telling me? You're telling me that a lemon order doesn't mean squat, right? You know, so you know, <laughs> you get it. You just desserts, right? I guess you know. <laughs> um, what was your being on that floor? Obviously, was a historical time, and I I think probably as a young man, you weren't anticipating being there. Just kind of evolved, and you you took it gracefully. What would you say was your favorite part of being a floor trader? Like the thing you just missed the most. Well, you know, I used to tell my neighbors and friends, you know, like, what do you do? Or I mean, try to explain to them. I was like, yeah. it was really like three professions all in one. And first of all, it was the lifestyle of a rock and roll star, right? I mean, yeah. you know, because of the money and, you know, let's be honest, the accoutrements that go along with money, um, that lifestyle, you know, you just can't, I mean, it's, it does deteriorate on you and it does wear on you after a long period of time, but uh, it, it was exciting. 
it had the physicality of a professional athlete, right? Yeah. Every day, you know, you it, you know, because you were like literally fighting for your life, right? You're fighting for your money, mm -hmm. and um, the excitement or the danger or the risk of, let's say, an air traffic controller, because if you made a mistake. Yeah, people you are know, die. lives are on the line. Are gonna die, yeah. right? You're yeah. going to die. You're going to die. And we're talking about dollars, right? Financial so, death is. I think, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was it was all of that all of that uh round in there. You know what I used to tell people I was like you you cannot explain what happened on the floor. It was like it was like gym class in high school with people that had too much money to know what they were going to do with it, right? So You conjured I mean, up some just... horrible memories right there. I don't want to think about gym class in high school. I, here I am holding you in such high esteem, and here he is, this floor chair. Now you're like talking about some guy's jock strap dangling in your face. Yeah, Forget it. pantsing somebody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's exactly what it was like, you know? So, you know, you're talking about, like, life of a trader. You know, most days were boring days, to be honest with you, you know, it would only be a few days a week, a few days a month where the market would be actually active. Most of the time, you know, we were sitting around waiting for something to happen, mm -hmm. and so that's the days when, you know, we do stupid things and make these side bets or, you know, um, Guy Talk like, about, like, like, like Caddyshack. I bet you fifty dollars the Schmales kid picks his nose. You know, <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Or, or you know, um, you know, doing things like you know, you, a, a guy, for instance, um, one of I think I think I told you a story where he had a buddy of ours who who would never take any time off, and he was he was always complaining that he needed to take some time off. And we were like, take some time off. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. And so we were so sick and tired of hearing him telling him that he didn't take any time off that we, we got together and we bought him and his wife a uh, all-expense trip to Hawaii. Now, at first, he didn't want to take the trip. But as soon as his wife going... And we're like, don't worry, Ronnie. We'll watch your market for you. We'll take care of your position every year. <laughs> and I swear to you, uh, the, the day that he left, the market had like three days of limit moves, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we set him away and then the market had the limit moves. And he came back and he was like, I'm never taking a vacation because, <laughs> you know, it always happens when I go away, the market makes these limit moves. So it was like a lot of weird, funny stuff like that. Nice. I like that. Good, good stuff. Uh, question came through here. Let me see. This Where is it at? Um, from Alan. He said, John mentioned that he went bust three or four times. Were all those at the beginning or some in the middle of your career? And, and how did you recover from those? Well, a couple were in the beginning because I didn't understand risk. Right? I was either taking too large of positions or I had too much exposure. Um, one time... You know, as I when I became a market maker, I in natural gas, I was one of the larger market makers, and there is this rivalry that goes on. And that when you go from an institutional trader to a market maker, you're taking the other side of every trade. And so institutional traders are out; they they want to make money too. But you know, so they learned, and I'm I'm not going to say which big bank was <laughs> the one of the ones learn what my position was or what my exposure was and they went out of their way to punish me right because they were trying to get me back for all those years where I was taking the other side of their trades and making money off of their trades so that was a learning lesson about exposure to the greater market mm -hmm. and that it was how it was important to make sure that I needed to be a lot more stealthier about you know not going around saying hey look at I'm long this position or I have this you know the spread on and then the last time where I had a blowout was in during the credit crisis of 2008 but that was a bloodbath everybody had and mm -hmm. there was nothing you could do do about that right and so but at that point um, my, my exposure was a lot smaller and even though I call it going broke the losses that I had were very limited but it was enough for me to say hey you know what I don't need this kind of risk anymore. So from that moment, I just walked away from, you know, handling other people's sure. money or any other people's orders and just really concentrated on, on my own stuff. And I think that, you know, Alan, the main thing is 
like I always preach, that you got to learn from those mistakes and make sure that you don't do them again. And, and granted, we're going to make yeah. those mistakes again, but hopefully, um, you know, when that mistake rears its head the second time and you're like, oh, I, I know what this did last time, the mistake isn't as bad or you eliminate it altogether. And hopefully, you know, you ingrain that in your trading style, your personality, the way that you execute, and you don't make those mistakes anymore. And that's really where I think you, you start to take things uh, and get, get much better at it. Um, what else did I have out here? Um... I think that was it. We had the question on that one. I had a I had a question for you, but I completely forgot what it was. So it, shame on me for for uh, forgetting what they were. Um, all right. So now, what are you doing? You got you got a lot of things on your plate. I know that you do a bunch of stuff with Bar Chart. Um, you got to, you're doing webinars every week. And for those who don't know, uh, if you haven't checked out BarChart.com, you can click on their webinar tab, and he's got. I know once a week you're doing something. So what what do you got on your plate? So next week we're going to go into commodity markets and we're going to look at you know all these skyrocketing commodity prices and see if we can learn a lesson from them and also maybe to discern are these big price movements something that as chairman Powell would say are transitional or uh, temporary mm -hmm. or are, is there something underlying that maybe we can learn from um, and that maybe some of these trends are going to carry on further, you know, in in, in time. So here, let me share my screen. Sure. Um, While you do that, Daniel says, uh, historical question, when the CME was formed, was it regulated by the government or did they come in later? You know, the CME was started in 1898 um, as the Butter and Eggs Board. I don't believe that there was a regulatory body at that point. Um, I, I think it came in later. Well, the CFTC uh, would uh, set rules and regulations. But was that around in 1898? Well, I think they've been around for a long period of time. But really, the, the what gave the exchanges credibility was a self-regulation. Now, of course, there would be a, there would be opportunities for traders to work around or you know bend the rules, but. I think what what the success or the reason why exchanges got strong is because we held ourselves to a much higher standard than what would be official. Right. Does that make kind of sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there were guys that would break the rules, and when they break the rules, they suffered the consequences because it was in our best interest to make sure that it was a fair playing um, field for everyone um, because. Uh, it gave the exchange a lot more credibility. If you, if the things that go on today in terms of these bats and algorithms and stuff, if we did those kind of things, we'd be in jail. I mean, that's yeah. how far, how much the market has changed. All right. right? So, can you see my my chart? Yep, here? I got my you. Chart? Yep, looks good. Okay, cool. So this is um, uh, crude oil. And this is what we call a, a spread, and this is the differential between. Um, the June 21 contract and the December 21 contract. And there's two words that I want you to understand, the two terms. One is called backwardation and the other one is called contango. And I know that you've had Don Dawson before and yep. you guys have talked about this. So here's the basics of it. Contangled is that the front month contracts traded a discount. And that's usually when the market is oversupplied or the demand has dropped significantly. When the market goes into backwardation, front month contracts trade to a premium. Now, this is usually a sign of strong demand or a strong bull trend or uptrend. Okay, so you can see here, this is crude oil, and this price action, this big drop right here was the beginning of COVID, right? Yep. And you can see the June contract fell to what is called contango or a discount to the December contract. And that was because of both... Um, you know, demand had just dropped out of sight, right? And also, we had an oversupply of crude oil at that time. The market rebalanced itself, right? But here, I want to show you guys is notice that this little sell-off, and look at this chart. This chart, we can use the same technical analysis that we use, you know, in terms of supply and demand. Right there, this little bottom, right? This is where price stopped going down. In other words, the June contract stopped being discounted and started going up. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of inflection points. So this first one, can you see that? That's 11.02, right? Yep. Can you see that? I got here. it. Is that on my screen? Yep. 
Okay, so that's 1102. All right, that's one day. Now, what has happened? Now, prices, the contango moves to parity or it goes to where now the June contract is trading at a premium to the December contract, a sign of strengthening demand or limited supply. And I don't think supply really changed here. I think this was more about the thought that we got an approval for vaccinations and an anticipation of um, an opening of an economy, the opening play, right? So that date is 11.24. Now, price kind of bounces around here, and then we get another big spike in price action, right? A breakout. That's the beginning of the year, right? Again, I think this was more about anticipation. So that's January 4th. And then here we can see where it peaked out, and that is March 8th, right? March 8th. Okay. Right. All right, so drum roll, ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, I know you're ready. This is what <laughs> prepped well, you on this. Well, plus I've been loving watching crude oil recently, so it's an interesting day today. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so hang on. Whoop. All right, so this is a July, the July contract, all right? Where did price stop going down in this trend that we had seen? 1102. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe that's coincidence, right? Price stopped going down and the contango stopped. All right. When did the price of July break out of this range? Yeah, run the green arrow. 1124. When the front month contracts went from being contango to backward dated, a confirmation that we were in an, in an uptrend. When did the price really accelerate, right? When did price really accelerate? Well, right here. January 5th. Where did price top out? Where did price stop going up, right? Where did my trend, in this case, maybe fizzled out. Right. March 8th. So you talk about things that I learned from the floor. One of the things that I learned from the floor from looking at energy markets, but this is this is not unique to energy markets. This is in grain markets. This is in, in softs. Uh, that this element of contangled tobacco radiation is a very powerful indicator of uh, the dynamics, fundamental and price dynamics of strong trends. Now, I noticed that from I watched your show yesterday, and you were looking. You're still using those crappy at charts, right? I know, how many times are you gonna stop <laughs> using those crappy at charts? It's right? just easy. <laughs> okay, I know it's easy, but look at this here, right? You would have been all over this, right? You would have been all over this short, right? Yeah. I mean, come on. And now you've got this trend breakdown. Now, you and I are probably the same kind of where you believe this trend has broken. Yeah, we've broken the trend line, but you and I are both saying not until I make a new what? A new low. Yeah, low right, yeah. I really believe that this trend is over. It's so funny. I, I'm going to keep your chart there. Don't do anything. I'm just going to flip over because I have – this is my chart. <laughs> it looks identical to yours. It's it's great. I mean, it, yes, I'm using the continuous contract or the at contract, but uh, it's funny how we both have the, the same thing. Anyway, okay, it's, back to you. It's exactly the same, right? I mean, even if I go to, let's say, the December contract, you're going to see basically the same price action, right? Okay. So one of the things that I'm saying is that – I don't think the crude oil trend is over until this contango falls back, this backwardation falls back close to parity. Now you can see on this chart here, there is this kind of bottom here where we're at around $1.50. So I think as long as July holds $1.50 above the December contract, then our trend will be in control. And maybe what might happen is the July contract might not go up, but certainly the December contract will follow in those contracts that came before it. So I'm really watching this in real time, see if this backwardation evaporates, and that could be a sign that the crude oil uptrend is really is over, the death of the uptrend. But if we hold this value, and as July expires, this value still holds, 
this is probably going to signal that we're going to see higher price action moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's interesting, um, very interesting because the the chart you have there from that red line on March eighth, you know, you guys can see that that's where it, it peaked. And of course, you, you don't know that it's going to peak there. It's all hindsight. However, the pattern that's formed since then has been this descending triangle, right? It's making the same lows but making lower highs. And when you look at that in contrast to what crude oil is doing, notice I'll put my cursor on March eighth. It's just about the the peak, right? So. It's showing that the the backwardation is actually getting a little bit weaker right now, and all of a sudden crude oil is responding to that. So, might be something for you to keep an eye on is the ratio between those two, because if it continues, um, this could pull crude oil further, getting down below, let's say that 60-50 mark or 60 dollar even mark. Uh, if that happens, then maybe we could see some more downside movement here. So, some some great stuff. Right, exactly. So, I mean, you know, I don't know. I love my it. personal feeling. I mean, am I still sharing, or you got your chart up? Uh, whatever you want. You, I, I, you go for it. I see your chart. Okay, you do see my chart. Yep. Okay. So this is where I think the key for us is, and I'm going to put up a comparison here. And the comparison I'm going to use here is I'm going to use the dollar index. And I really believe that what will drive the next leg to all commodity prices, if this is transitory or if this is a super cycle, is the value of the dollar. And then you can see that there is an inverse correlation to the price of crude and the dollar index. This blue line represents the dollar index. Notice that here's where the dollar started to go down, and that was exactly the same time where the crude oil prices started to go up. So that is that correlation. Now, where did this market peak out well is as the dollar was strengthening. Now we've kind of gone sideways here, but what is the dollar doing now? Free fall. <laughs> it's falling. Yeah, it's yeah. falling. And yeah, crude oil prices have been going up now in recent days, the last three days, crude oil prices have backed up. I think this could be a combination of both the expiration of the June contract, you know, as people are rolling from one contract to the other or taking a lot of profits who have been in this trade, right? This whole deleverage uh, talk that's been going on in the market over the last, not only just in crude oil, but in all assets. Sure. And um, I really believe that the key to the next leg in commodities is going to be what is the dollar going to do? And now, you know, this 89 value, and if you look at a dollar index chart, yeah, it's not looking good, man. It doesn't look good, right? I mean, well, I mean, you're I mean, printing trillions and trillions of more money. I mean, uh, the odds are it's going to push it down. So, trend right. is your friend. So, right? I mean, I think if you can see here, it looks like if it breaks. I mean, let's go to less like a ten-year time frame, right? If we break this eighty-nine level, I mean, this is a free fall back to eighty. That's a you know a ten percent fall in the do do price of the dollar. Well, a ten percent move. In the price of the dollar, the last leg that we had, crude oil went from $45 to $65. So, I mean, could we see crude oil prices get back up? And then again, on your show yesterday, you said there was some overhead supply around $70. I think we really could think about $90 or $92. Wow. So, and, and that's based off, and I think Naum just says the dollar is falling along with oil. For right now it is, but if, if the dollar keeps falling, especially if it breaks below that level that you see on the chart that John's got, you know, the, the, the crude oil most likely will pick back up and break those highs that we saw at about 67 bucks. Uh, and then, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's potentially off of the races. I agree with you 100%, yeah. yeah. Awesome, man. Well, hey, uh, tons of amazing content as always. I, I, um, I always love when you come on and give us more content. But I look at the, the show time here and I'm like, man, we, we're going to end up going two hours today. We can't be doing I that. Know, I'm sorry. No, sorry. It's, I don't ever apologize for giving out good content. I love it. Um, your upcoming webinar, is it along the same lines? That I know you talked about the future side of things. I know you talked about you know some of these commodities like like uh, rough lumber. Man, I don't know if you guys saw the rough lumber chart, but that thing has been lock limit almost every single day for the past <laughs> couple of weeks now. I mean, if, if you if you want to know the definition of stress and uh, get a prescription for some ulcer medication, go out there and start trading actively in the lumber market, guys. That, that one will destroy you right away. Crazy. Uh, is that what your upcoming webinar at Bar Chart is on? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look at these long term trends in 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 most of the majors. So we're gonna look at energies, we're gonna look at metals, and we're gonna look at grains, and we're gonna try to figure out is 
what we're seeing kind of a seasonal effect or is this something more of a, a mega cycle? The last super cycle we had was from 2008 to 2000, spring of 2011 when we had the quantitative easing and, and influx of monetary uh, from the TARP and the credit crisis, and that lasted 28 months. We're only, th this recent rally started at about October, end of October of this past year, so we're only about six months into what could be a two and a half year super cycle. And, and I think that if you do see the weakening of the dollar, that'll be the precipice that's gonna take us to this next this next hyperlink. Now, if markets it could be grains could be seasonal, and 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 um, uh, we have a reflux of uh, COVID in around the world, dampening crude oil demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then all bets are off. But think about if we don't, right? If things get back to what we consider normal, right? Sure. All this price action has been in anticipatory. But as soon as we move past that and a weakening dollar, I think you could see some some bigger price movements. Good. Let's bring on the big swings. We love big swings. Makes it fun for yeah. us out there. Volatility, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right, John. Well, it looks like uh, that webinar, by the way, guys, I'll, I'll bring it up here. You go to barchart.com. If you click on tools, you'll see a little piece there that says free webinars. You click on that one, takes you to this page. That is going to be next Wednesday at noon central time, Wednesday the 26th, noon central time, the, uh, making sense of skyrocketing commodity prices. He's got a bunch of other webinars you can see archived there as well at barchart.com. So, hey, John, thank you so much for coming on. I do appreciate it. Love always having you on. And uh, thank you for telling me some stories from the floor and a day in the life of a trader. I appreciate the uh, time and uh, good good trading to everyone out there. All right, take care. All right, guys, John Rowland, you guys have seen him on here many times, always gives some amazing Ooh. content. Some of the, the backwardation and contango pieces I think is very interesting, especially when we look at the spreads between those two. Um, you know, I, I wanted to share his experiences because I think people have a a misconception of what it's like to be a floor trader. So I, I thought you guys might enjoy that one as much as I do because I love talking about these things on a regular basis. Now, I see that Jerry asked a question a few times and I didn't get a chance to um, answer it. He says, when was the CME's last day? Well, it's not done technically. I believe they still have the Euro dollar pit open, um, but the grains have been closed since I think uh, March of last year because of COVID. They haven't opened those up, so it's slowly dying. Um, ultimately, it's it'll go away. I mean, honestly, it's just such a big infrastructure piece, uh, but right now, I do believe the Euro dollars are still there, so you can't say it's completely dead on the floors, um, but even when I went, God, I went back and I want to say 2008, maybe 2009, somewhere in there, um, and I went went on the floor of the CME. Just an amazing experience, and even then it was like it was it was dying at that time, but the energy was just incredible on the small pits that I was on. Uh, but I remember I was walking by, I believe it was live cattle, and there were two. It was literally a pit, right? You got this little hole, little stadium seating, and there's these two guys, and they're on their phones, and they're just leaning on the railings around it. They were just so bored. There was nothing going on in the pit. Just a sign of the times because everyone was just going over to digital um, and going to screen-based trading. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that one. Um, sounds so much like an engineer. It's more like it than Bob does. Well, you know, he's systematic, right? He's got to have an approach to these markets that's rule-based, structured. He knows exactly what he's doing. And again, when you're there, I think one of the things that I, that I miss about my trading floor, which is a retail trading floor, is I knew who on that floor was making money on average, who was, you know, not winning every day, but I could, I knew because I could look at their trade sheets. I shouldn't have been doing that, but I did. Um, and I also knew who was full of crap. You know, you see a lot of people on the trading floor. There was this one young guy who, you know, uh, ABC World News Tonight had him on camera. He made $60,000 in on Dell in one day in front of the CNBC, uh, ABC World News Tonight cameras. And little do they know that, yeah, he made $60,000 that day, but he lost 40 the next, and 30 the day after, and 20 the day after. So here's this guy that is perceived as being this great trader because he made $60,000 in one day, but at the end of the week, he's not up 60 grand, he's down like 50 overall. And that to me is a crappy, crappy trader. So uh, you start to learn who's good, who's bad, and then you kind of model yourselves after them or learn what they're doing and pay attention to what they say and do. And I'm sure that that's one of the major factors that helped John Rowland and his career is saying, hey, 
I know that guy over there. I can tell he's making money. I know he's making money. I can see the trades. You know, I've got connections. I know people. I'm buddying up to that guy and starting to, you know, learn from him, if not follow it in his coattails. So it was um, awesome. Great, great stuff. I love every time we have an online trading academy conference, I really try to, to get together with all the floor trader guys. To me, they're the most fun stories. It's um, uh, did floor traders journal. Uh, probably not. I don't think they had time. It's funny because John mentioned there was a physical business. These guys are bumping and slamming into each other. I mean, Bob Dunn, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he actually had a back injury that was caused from the floor. I think he got trampled in the pits. I mean, when it gets crazy energy and, you know, imagine like a Black Friday day where people are just beside themselves, pushing, shoving, elbowing, punching, kicking. I mean, it's got to be absolutely crazy on that floor. Most days it's not that wild, but you get an FOMC statement like back in 1999, when Alan Greenspan cut rates by 50 basis points in the middle of a trading day without telling anybody. I mean, those pits just erupt with craziness uh, at that moment in time. So, you know, people are getting hurt out there. It was really, really cool. Uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed that segment. Let me go and just show you economic calendar and earnings calendar stuff. This is what happened for uh, today. If we look what happened, you have applied materials. You had Canadian Solar, Palo Alto Networks, and Ross Stores report. Retailers, guys, have really, for the most part, been putting in some very good numbers so far this earnings season. Most of them have been doing very, very well. Um, most of these companies, except for Kohl's, were up big today. Kohl's was supposed to report before market opened, but I don't see um, a surprise number here. that They beat handily, right? They were supposed to come out with no earnings, zero, and they came out at $1.05. You would think that that would just spike them to the moon. They're down 10%. Crazy stuff. All right. Here's what's happening for tomorrow. As I told you, I will not be doing a show tomorrow. I'm going to be in meetings as I'm going to be building out a cryptocurrency program. So I'm in with the, the top brass to get that done. Um, this is a big day tomorrow, though. So for those of you who are trading the euro or you're trading the pound or the USD, even the Canadian dollar, there's some pretty big economic announcements. Look at the manufacturing data starting at the wee hours of the morning. This is all Pacific time, but you have right after midnight, French flash and uh, services PMI numbers or French flash manufacturing PMI numbers. For the Germans, you have that as well. 15 minutes after that at one o'clock in the morning, you have flash manufacturing PMI as well as services PMI for the EU. And then... A half hour after that, you got it for the UK. And then later on in the day, you have flash manufacturing PMI and services PMI coming out for the US. Uh, Canada has retail sales numbers, which are expected to drop rather sharply, get cut in half, and that's at 5.30. So a lot of stuff. One number that I am uh, particularly interested in is going to be this existing home sales. There's a lot of home data coming out next week. And I'm curious to see whether things might start have started to slow down. I've been watching Toll Brothers and some home builders here that look a little interesting with regards to market weakness. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, that will do it for me for today. How many tickets and what is your uh, price limit on fish? Well, just try to, if you can get them through Ticketmaster or something. And, and by the way, if you can get a fish ticket for Halloween night, I mean, it's like the ultimate scalp ticket, really. There's, there's such demand, but um, I'm trying to get one ticket for each night. There's a four pack and the four pack, I don't know what it goes for, but I want to pay retail prices. I'm happy to pay someone a premium if you end up getting it for me. But uh, what I don't want to do is go to scalpers. Scalpers are just the scum of the earth. And right now a four day pass on the scalped market is going for $5,000. I obviously am not paying $5,000 for a four day pass, but I will get one one way or another. So if anybody gets them, I'll buy whatever tickets you have from you and uh, give you a little premium. Um, if you don't get them, no worries. I'm going to get them one way or another. Just figured I got an army. May as well see if you guys can get tickets and maybe even scout them for yourself. All right, that's going to do it for me. Uh, email me if you have any questions, comments, feedback. TraderMarone at gmail.com. Go to barchart.com if you want to learn more from John Rowland. He's got basically once a week a free webinar, which is just great content where he'll dive deeper into some of the, the pressing topics. I think I'll probably be in that one as well simply because I'm very interested in what's going on with corn and wheat, uh, lumber, soybeans. These commodities are all over the place. Thank you to a weak dollar, but boy, there have been some great trading opportunities in those, and it's usually not my area of expertise to trade, but uh, knowing John and his experience, I'll probably learn a bunch from him as well in that, uh, in that webinar. So check that one out. Am I into watches? No. Sorry, chicken. I don't own any jewelry. You know what? I, I, my attitude has always been, if you wear something flashy, I think people steal from you. They'll want to steal it. They'll want to take it. Uh, no jewelry. I wear gla you know, sunglasses. That's about it. But uh, no, not a, not a watch person. I have a bunch of watches, but I never wear them. But then, you know, people want to ask you what time it is. Like, don't you have a phone? Check your own phone. Don't bug me for the time. 
All right, uh, let's see. No guests scheduled yet for next week. Maybe I'll work on that over the weekend. But I hope you all have a fantastic Friday. There's a lot of economic announcements coming out tomorrow. Really on the earnings front, nothing big to report. Uh, so no worries on the earnings front. But economic is definitely something you guys should pay attention to. Thank you guys so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed John Rowland as much as I do. I will see you all on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend, everybody. Cheers. I'll see you next week.